I'm going to talk about uh, self-supervised learning and the one of the one issue that I consider one of the main issues, uh, one of the main, main obstacles to making true progress in AI, uh, which is the problem of representing uncertainty. So I'm sure a lot of you are, are you know, saying to themselves, representing uncertainty, that's easy. We just, you know, uh, represent probability distributions. Uh, but in fact, uh, it's, uh, turns out to be much more complicated than this in the context that I'm, I'm going to talk about. Next slide, please. Alors, je je n'ai pas le contrôle, n'est-ce pas? Non, non. Il okay. faudra juste me prévenir. OK, so I'll, I'll just ask you to switch slides. OK, so I see three challenges in AI and machine learning, three main challenges. The first one is learning uh, with fewer labels, uh, fewer label samples, uh, or fewer trials in the case of reinforcement learning uh, or, or control. Uh, and it's the fact that supervised learning and reinforcement learning re re require way too much samples or, or trials. Um, and uh, what we observe in humans and animals is that, you know, animals and humans both are capable of learning new skills very, very quickly. Humans can learn to drive a car in about 20 hours of, of practice without, uh, uh, you know, any, any accident or anything like this. And, uh, we still don't have techniques that can actually get a car, get an autonomous car to learn to drive itself. Uh, even with tens of thousands of hours of recorded driving by experts or, or with trial and error. Uh, the second problem that we need to solve is uh, getting machines to learn to reason, not just uh, recognize an image. So we're currently pretty good at doing perception and things like this and you know, relatively simple tasks that, that can be done in sort of a, a fixed number of steps of, uh, of inference. Uh, but reasoning may require uh, more complex uh, uh, processes for computing an output, if you want. Uh, and in humans, we have both, uh, both things. You know, there is what Daniel Kahneman calls uh, system one, system two. So, which is, you know, system one is what we do sort of reactively, intuitively, uh, what we are, we've been trained to do, so we, we don't have to think about it. And then system two is when we need to plan in advance. And we don't know really how to do this with learning machines. So we know, we know how to hardwire reasoning in machines uh, using symbol, symbols and logic, but we don't know how to do this uh, in ways that are compatible with, uh, with machine learning. So basically in ways that are sort of continuous, if you want. Next slide. The, the, the third item in this slide, uh, I'm not going to talk about. Uh, oops. Okay, so uh, the, one of the one of the questions here is uh, uh, how can humans uh, learn so efficiently and so quickly? And so we, we might want to look a little bit about uh, how uh, human babies learn, for example. Uh, and uh, 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 we, what we what we see is that uh, you know babies learn very basic concepts about the world uh, very early. Uh, things like uh, detecting biological motion, for example, the, you know, distinguishing uh, animate from inanimate objects, things like object permanence, uh, stability, and then it takes about nine months for babies to figure out that there is gravity and inertia, so that an object that is not supported will fall. Uh, and most of that is learned mostly by observation, a little bit by interaction, but in the early months of life, you, uh, human babies don't interact very well. So it's, uh, it's mostly observation. So one question we can ask ourselves is how how is it that humans can and animals can learn how the world works mostly by observation? In my opinion, this is the type of learning that we need to reproduce in machines if we want them to be able to acquire vast amounts of background knowledge about uh, how the world works, uh, you know, model the world basically, learn models of the world, uh, but also learn to represent the world. Uh, and, and this is not task dependent. You know, a lot of this learning is, is, is done in a completely task independent way. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, you know, perhaps if we succeed in uh, designing learning algorithms of this type that can learn by observation and figure out how the world works, uh, the, 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 the system will train this way, will be able to accumulate enough background knowledge to, so that a certain, certain level of common sense will emerge. Uh, this is very speculative, but uh, but this is a path towards uh, uh, machine acquiring vast amounts of uh, of knowledge uh, from unable data. Next slide. Um, 
in fact, a lot of people have been have been sort of you know talking about this. The fact that we have mental models of the world, and that you know common sense is not facts; it's a collection of models, uh, a collection of of uh, representations of the world that we can manip manipulate and allow us to predict. Uh, this is my my dear colleague Jitendra Malik here, who is a big fan of this idea as well. Uh, and there is you know a lot of people in the context of reinforcement learning uh, these days that uh, basically use learn models as the the basis for control. Next slide. Right, so that was the motivation. Now about self-supervised learning. So self-supervised learning is the, the name I, I give to uh, this sort of paradigm of learning, uh, which is not very different from what you know what, what we're all used to. Um, uh, in fact, perhaps subsumes uh, things like supervised learning, uh, 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 structure prediction, and you know what we used to call unsupervised learning. I don't like the term, which is why I, I use self-supervised learning. So uh, imagine a situation where we show a machine a few frames of a video clip and we ask it to predict the, what, what's going to happen next uh, in the video clip. And, and then we reveal the future. Next slide, please. Uh, and uh, so when the future is revealed, the machine can compare its prediction from what actually occurred and correct itself so that it makes a proper prediction. So this would be a model that predicts the you know, future events uh, in the world from video which is a very hard problem that nobody has really solved these days. But you can imagine other situations where the, uh, the, the, the input basically uh, contains part, uh, part of it that is visible, and then other parts that are either visible or not visible, but you, you never know which one will be visible or not visible. Uh, and so basically, self-supervised learning is just learning to fill in the blanks. You know, you have partial information and you fill in the blanks. Next slide. Uh, so there are really two uses for self-supervised learning. The first one is to learn representations of the of the of the data of the world in a task-independent way. Um, so you use uh, SSL as as a as, as a um, preliminary uh, training procedure, uh, and then you fine-tune on a, a supervised or reinforcement uh, learning phase. And the second one is to learn predictive forward models of the world that would uh, allow a robot or a machine to plan ahead. You know, have some a uh, prediction of what can happen in the world and then use this to do model predictive control or, or policy learning or model-based RL. Uh, but the big question there is how to represent uncertainty and multimodality in the prediction. So in uh, when you show a system uh, a piece of video, there are many, many ways the, that this video can be uh, uh, continued. Uh, you, you're watching me right now and you know I could choose to say a word or another. I could choose to move my head to the left or to the right. And if you ask a, if you train a system with a video like this, and you ask the system to predict the next few frames, it cannot decide whether I'm going to move my head to the right or to the left because uh, I probably do this half the time. And so, if you ask for a single prediction, the system will will produce uh, an average of all the possible predictions, assuming it's trained with z square or something like that. And it's going to be a blurry version of myself, which is not a good prediction. So, how do we deal with uncertainty? Uh, next slide. So uh, I'm going to propose this idea of energy-based models. So energy-based models uh, essentially are a, a sort of a weaker form of probabilistic models, if you want, but uh, where we do not insist that the measurement of uncertainty be related to uh, or directly related to, uh, to density or probability. Um, uh, and, and this weaker form uh, may allow to reduce some of the computational intractability that occur in the probabilistic models. Okay, so what we're going to do is the problem we need to solve is that given an observation x and given a variable to be predicted y, we want the system to possibly give us multiple values of y that are compatible with x, multiple continuations of a video clip or something like that, right? If we have a, a model like a, a neural net or a deep learning system, a function g of x that takes x and produces a prediction y bar, uh, it's only one prediction. And so uh, a, a model that just computes an output will not be able to do this uh, unless this output represents uh, scores over multiple, uh, mul multiple alternatives, which is uh, how classifiers work, actually. But what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to you know, basically make the variable to be predicted y an input to the system. And uh, we, our learning system is going to be a function f of x, y that computes the compatibility or the incompatibility between x and y. We're going to call it an energy. So if x and y are compatible, f of x, y is small. And if x and y are incompatible, 
we want S, f of xy to be larger. Okay, um, and we'll see that you know probabilistic models are kind of a interesting special case if you want. Next uh, slide, please. So uh, inference in this context consists in finding a a y check uh, here that minimizes uh, f of x y for a given x, and there might be several answers, uh, several possible y's, uh, uh, and you know the the shape of uh, f of x y can uh, you know can can be very diverse, uh, but what we need is that for a given value of x, we need the correct, the compatible value of values of y to have lower energy than the incompatible values of y. So here's a, a very simple example here at the bottom. Uh, x is a scalar variable, y is a scalar variable, and there is an obvious relationship between x and y, uh, where y is equal to x squared or something like this is a parabola. What you want is uh, those blue dots, which are the data points, to have lower energy than uh, everything else for a given value of x, as you move along the y direction, you want the correct value of y to be to have the lowest. But of course, in, in, in general, you want multiple values of y to have low energy. Next slide. Um, so here's an example here uh, where the, the data, uh, so the, the relationship between x and y is not a is not a function, essentially. And so there uh, you need this sort of you know this this measure of compatibility, right? Um, uh, which again, you know, keep in mind this is kind of a, a weaker formalism than than, than probabilistic modeling. Um, so basically, an energy-based model is an implicit function that captures the dependency between x and y by uh, you know taking low values when x and y are, are compatible and larger values otherwise. Next slide. Uh, so we can do, if uh, we design f of xy or we construct it in some way so that it's uh, continuous and differentiable, then we can use uh, gradient-based uh, methods to do inference. Uh, I haven't talked about learning yet, it's just inference, right? Um, but we can you know, compute the gradient of f of xy with respect to y for a given x and then uh, optimize that. Or we could use exhaustive search if y is a discrete variable, or we could use other types of you know, efficient uh, inference uh, if, uh, uh, in other situations. Next slide. Um, so there are two types of uh, energy-based models, the conditional ones and unconditional ones. So in the conditional ones, there's a set of variables that we know are always observed that we call X. Uh, they're observed both on the training set and the test set, basically, or in, in, in training mode and, and test mode. And then another set of variable Y, and these, uh, we don't know if we're gonna be able to observe them or not. They may be observed at, at training time and test time, but we don't know which one within Y would be observed. Uh, so in the conditional, in the unconditional version of uh, energy-based models, there is no x. There is no variable that you know for sure you're going to observe. So think of something like, um, uh, you know, image denoising or something like that, right? So uh, you you don't actually know any any pixel, although there is an x which is a noisy image, if you if you'd like. Uh, but what you're trying to do is find uh, find an image y that you know is both clean and close to the the initial uh, noisy input, which you can think of as minimizing an energy of some kind, right? And a lot of methods do this. Next slide. Uh, so of course we can always uh, trans or almost always uh, or pretty actually pretty rarely transform an energy-based model into a probabilistic model, and we can use the Gibbs uh, Boltzmann distribution. Um, you know, uh, p of y x, uh, you know, can be computed as e to the minus some constant beta uh, f of x y, and we divide it by the integral of that over y, and so we get uh, basically a distribution that integrates to one, which has the right property for a distribution. Whether it's actually a good estimate of a dis uh, probability distribution depends on how we train this uh, energy-based model, which we're going to talk about next. Next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so you know, inference can be hard depending on the nature of the y variable. Uh, next slide. Okay, one more. Here we go. Um, okay, so there are several types of architectures that have been used over the last few years with uh, more more or less success for uh, energy for which you can interpret as energy-based models and that are used for self-supervised learning. Uh, a very popular one in the last few years is joint embedding architectures. Uh, and there are, there are several ways to train it, which is why I haven't talked yet about how you train those things. So, but let's, let's just talk about architectures now, right? So, uh, 
So this is a type of architecture where the Y variable is fed into a parameterized function, say a neural net. And if this parameterized function has, uh, and, and then you, you feed also X to a parameterized, another parameterized function. Uh, and then you compare the, the representations, the vectors, the output vectors uh, computed by those two networks uh, from, from, from X and Y. Uh, in some ways, using a divergence or a distance of some kind. So, uh, if the so and, and that would be the energy function. So the energy function basically is some sort of distance measure between the outputs of those two networks. Um, and the networks can be identical or not. Uh, at this point, I'm not making any assumption. So, uh, you can have kind of multimodality uh, in this case because uh, the the network that looks at y may have uh, an invariant subspace. And so I, as I vary y, h prime, which uh, is the output of that, of that network, is not going to vary. And therefore, the, uh, the energy may stay low or stay high, but, but let's say stay, stay low. And so the system will you know, implement some sort of multimodality this way through the invariance properties of the network on the right that, that takes y into account. Um, there's also going to be invariance property with respect to x, but that's a different story. That's not multimodality. Uh, for a given x uh, in, in the in y space. So this idea, uh, this particular uh, case of this idea where the two networks are identical, this is called a Siamese network. And the idea for this goes back to one of my papers from the early 90s, but, um, and, and then some other papers uh, with my students, Sumitra Prime, Raya Hetzel in the V2000. Uh, and this idea has actually uh, gained a lot of attention over the last year or two, um, because it's basically, the, the main approach for which uh, people do self-supervised learning in the context of computer vision these days. And I'll, I'll come back to this in a minute. Next slide. So what we've seen with those joint embedding architectures is that the way we handle multimodality between X and Y is, is through the invariance properties of some network that uh, we feed uh, Y uh, to. But there's another way, and another way is to directly predict um, the, the variable Y, but to parameterize the set of, of uh, uh, plausible predictions of y through a latent variable. Okay, so here is an architecture here. You look at x, you run it through some neural net, it extracts some representation of, of x, and then uh, x together with a latent variable z go into um, uh, what is called here a decoder, and that makes a prediction. If you allow the latent variable to vary over a set or a distribution, uh, you will get uh, a, a sort of uh, resulting uh, set of predictions or distribution over, over, over predictions, the energy being the discrepancy between the, the proposed y and the, the prediction. So uh, the inference, uh, inference in, in one of those systems, a simple form of inference would consist in, given a pair of x and y, finding the z that minimizes the energy, and uh, that tells you whether the y is in the, the set of... Uh, 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 outputs that are compatible with X if you get a low, a low energy at that point. Uh, you'd like Z to be structured in some way, and uh, there is some uh, issue, uh, issues with this architecture that I'll come back to in a minute. Um, next slide. Uh, so in particular, this latent type of latent variable model is, is, has been very popular for decades in contexts like speech recognition, handwriting recognition, translation, things like this, where uh, Z, you can you can think of Z as uh, you know something like uh, in the case of handwriting recognition, you don't know you know where the characters are, and you have to sort of infer a latent variable that would basically uh, be the the segmentation. And there are kind of similar processes in a lot of uh, uh, you know a, 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 a decoder, for example, for a speech recognition system is based on this idea that you you find the shortest path in a graph, and you can think of this as uh, minimization with respect to a latent variable. Next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, so uh, in terms of uh, latent variable models, and, and again, this is this is you know this is not going to be any news to a, a lot of you who've been you know playing with uh, probabilistic models and graphical models for a long time. In fact, the the symbolism I'm using here is very similar to what's called factor graphs, where you have variable nodes and factors that uh, basically represent constraints between the uh, between the variables. Um, so if we have a model with latent variables, it now has, uh, it's an energy function that I call E now, not F, a uh, more elementary energy function that uh, needs to be, during inference, needs to, to be minimized with respect to both Y and Z. So if I give you an X, you find a combination of Y and Z that minimizes energy, and that's, uh, that's the inference process. 
uh, but I can redefine f of xy uh, through the elimination of z, which I can do in two ways. Uh, I can do in many ways, but I'm, I'm just going to talk about two. The first one is just minimize the energy E with respect to Z. And so the minimum over Z of E of X, Y, Z is going to be defined as F of X, Y. I, I, I call it F infinity. Uh, and uh, there is a, a kind of soft version of that where you actually marginalize over Z in sort of a probabilistic-like approach. And you just redefine F as minus one over beta, an arbitrary positive constant, log of the integral over Z or the sum if Z is discrete of E to the minus beta e of x, y, z. So this actually corresponds to uh, an energy function over, over x, y that marginalizes uh, over the, the z variable. And in fact, uh, I call the resulting energy function f because uh, from the physics point of view, it's actually a free energy. Next slide. Uh, next slide, please. I already talked about that. Uh, okay, so this I'm not going to go through this, but this basically explains why this uh, this formula is a marginalization, and uh, it's a completely you know a, a direct application of uh, the the Gibbs-Boltzmann distribution uh, on on the the joint uh, uh, distribution p of y z, and then if you marginalize this over z, you get p of y x. But then if you do this using the Gibbs-Boltzmann uh, formula, you can uh, define uh, uh, f uh, of x y as as this formula at the bottom. Uh, and it satisfies the Gibbs Boltzmann distribution. Uh, and again, this is very well known for a lot of people working with probabilistic models. Next slide. Um, okay, so let's talk about uh, concrete examples of unconditional latent variable energy based models. Uh, and there are a number that you probably know already. One of, one of them is k means, and the other one is sparse coding. Um, so, uh, k means, uh, in k means, the, the reason. Uh, so how is it that K, when we train a k-mean system, the energy surface uh, uh, has the right shape? And it turns out like k-means uh, works because when you when you look at the energy profile uh, in the in the y space in the data space of uh, of k-means, you get a bunch of energy wells uh, that are indicated by those dark spots here on the the top right. Uh, and the number of those energy wells uh, is limited by k. It's, you exactly have k of them because uh, you can only have k prototypes. And so the energy is zero when the input is equal to one of the prototypes and it grows quadratically as you move away from this prototype until you get closer to another prototype and then it decreases again. And so you get this uh, energy surface here. Um, the, 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 the purple spiral corresponds to, will correspond to you know, the, the the surface in which we sample data points. Um, and, and this is the result of applying k-means to the situation. At the bottom is the result of applying a, a interesting form of sparse coding, which I'm not going to go into the details of, where there we want to linearly reconstruct y by multiplying a sparse vector z by a, a, a dictionary matrix w. Um, and we uh, enforce the sparsity by adding a term to the energy, which is an L1 uh, regularization on the, uh, uh, a regularization of the L1 norm of the, the Z vector. In the case of uh, 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 k-means, the Z vector is a one-hot vector, so it's uh, by construction limited. So the reason I'm showing you those, those two familiar examples is that in the case of k-means, the volume of space that can take low energy is limited by construction, and we're going to call this architectural methods. In the case of sparse coding, the volume of space that can take low energy is limited by a regularizer. The regularizer actually limits the volume of space that can take low energy. And we'll see how this is important uh, a little later. Next slide. Um, so here is the issue with uh, latent variable model, whether they're conditional, they're conditional or not. The issue is, uh, as I showed you here uh, in just, uh, just a minute ago, is the, 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 the issue is that um, if you allow your latent variable to take whatever value it wants, and if it has a large uh, uh, high dimension, let's say, uh, for any x, there's going to be a y, uh, for any x and y, there's going to be a value of z that basically makes the energy zero, right? Imagine that z has the same dimension of y, and uh, the decoder is a simple function, let's say it could even be the identity, if z has the uh, same or higher dimension as y, then there's always going to be a z that is going to produce whatever y you feed to it. And so uh, during inference, the system will just you know, um, fill z with, uh, with y or something akin to it. And the system uh, will happily ignore x and always give you zero error. Uh, 
Now, this is a bad energy-based model because it gives you zero error for every point in Y. So basically, your energy surface is flat. Okay. So the big question is, how do we make sure that the energy surface is not flat so that when we push down the energy on data points to make sure it's low, how do we make sure that the energy is higher outside of those data points? And one answer to this is you regularize the capacity, the information capacity of the latent variable. You limit the number of different values it can take. You limit the volume of space that it can occupy without paying a price uh, by making it sparse, for example, with a sparsity uh, criterion. You can make it low dimensional, which is what PCA does. Um, th there's a number of different methods. You can you know, minimize the L0 norm, the L1 norm. The, there's a lot of different methods. None of them is perfect. Uh, but that's the basic idea. Limit the capacity, the information capacity of Z. And uh, as a consequence, you, you make the energy outside of a small volume uh, higher because you don't have any value of Z that encode anything in uh, outside the manifold of data, basically. Next slide. OK, so how are we going to train an energy-based model? Uh, so we're going to parameterize the energy function, obviously. Uh, and we're going to. We're going to have two, two different methods, contrastive methods. So contrastive methods will consist in pushing down on the data points, the, the, blue, uh, the blue beads here. There's supposed to be an animation here. And, um, and then you're going to push up on points outside of, the, of the, the data manifold, whatever you want to call it, the region of, uh, of data. And so the, the, the energy surface is going to shape itself so that you know, it takes higher values outside the data than, than on the data. So those are contrastive methods. Uh, there are huge problems with those, which is that they, they're very inefficient. And I'll, I'll come to this. Uh, I'll give you some empirical evidence for that. And then there is those regularizer architectural methods of which k-means and sparse coding are, where you limit the volume of white space that can take low energy through a regularizer on a latent variable or through other methods, architectural methods or other regularizers. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, uh, this is a bit of an eye chart that I don't expect you to, to read through, but uh, this is basically classifying classical methods uh, in supervised and unsupervised learning in terms of whether they're contrastive or regularized or architectural. So classical normalized probabilistic models, like say mixture of Gaussian or something like this, are actually uh, architectural methods. By construction, the probability distribution is normalized. And so when you give high probability uh, to something, you have to give low probability to something else. Or when you give low energy to something, you have to give high energy to something else, right? Um, same with PCA and k-means. They are kind of limited by construction. Uh, sparse coding, as I said, uh, is limited through a regularizer. And there are other similar methods that are also limited by regularizers. Now, contrastive methods you know, basically encompass most of the methods that uh, people have been using in machine learning, certainly in probabilistic modeling over the last uh, several decades. Uh, maximum likelihood. Um, if your model is, you know, needs to be explicitly normalized with a partition function, is actually a contrastive method. We'll see this in a second. And everything that approximates maximum likelihood, uh, like uh, Monte Carlo, Markov chain Monte Carlo, um, uh, Hamilton and Monte Carlo, contrastive divergence, this uh, Siamese network metric learning type uh, method that I talked about earlier, uh, generative adversarial networks, um, uh, probability flow, et cetera, those are all contrastive methods. And a very popular one that, that has emerged over the last two years is the uh, idea of denoising autoencoder. That's also a contrastive method. It's very popular in natural language processing. Uh, it led to incredible progress in uh, natural language understanding with this idea of masked autoencoder, where you train a transformer. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, I'm going to skip over this. This kind of shows that why maximum likelihood is a contrastive method, and it basically you know, shows in the end that when you, you write the, the, the conditional likelihood of y given x and you want to minimize the negative log of it uh, for, for a given sample and you compute the, the gradient of this, you, you realize very, very quickly that this will have the effect of making the energy of data points low. Uh, this is uh, f of x, y. And then make the energy of other points sampled from the distribution that your model gives to the data higher. In fact, it will push them to infinity. Next slide, please. And that's actually uh, the major issue with, uh, uh, so again, this was supposed to be an uh, animation, but the, uh, the major issue with probabilistic approaches is that if your data manifold is a thin plate, what a probabilistic method will want to do is make the energy on the data manifold as low as possible and make the energy just outside of this manifold basically plus infinity. 
And so your energy surface is going to look like a very narrow canyon in the end if, the, if your function is infinitely flexible. Of course, in practice, you regularize the function. So you make it such that the, the energy function actually does not go all the way to maximizing the likelihood. And so you abandon the idea of maximizing likelihood altogether. You kind of, uh, of course, if you're a Bayesian, you say, well, that's just a prior. But you know, if you're not a Bayesian, you say, well, I'm adding a regularizer. Uh, but the point is, you're not doing maximum likelihood anymore. So you know, what's the point of keeping this, con this, this, uh, uh, this criterion if it doesn't do what you want in the end, and you have to correct it so that it does what you want? That seems a little uh, like scratching your left ear with the right arm by going behind your, your head. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm basically arguing against probabilistic modeling here. Um, and this is a, you know, a well-known issue. Uh, so th there are other losses uh, which are not negative log, li log likelihood, but things like basically contrastive losses that you know, take a, a data point and, uh, and take a, a negative point or a set of, of other points that, that you know are outside the manifold. And you plug the energies of those points into an energy function, into a loss function, in such a way that the loss function is a increasing, uh, monotically increasing function of the, of the energy of the good guy of the training set, the training samples, and a decreasing function, at least uh, partially, of, uh, of the other terms. And the effect of this loss function will be to push down on the energy of the good guys, push up on the energy of the bad guys in various ways. And you have a, a whole world of choice of those loss functions um, you know, that, that um, is very diverse. Next uh, slide, please. Um, so a very popular one is uh, is margin loss or generalized margin loss, uh, you know, which so the, the one at the bottom just you know takes the the difference between the energy of a good guy and a bad guy and basically tries to push the energy of the bad guy uh, up from that of the good guy and so that the difference is at least some margin and the margin might depend on the distance or you know some measure of distance between the two the two y's between the good guy and the bad guy. Next slide. So that's just one example. Um, this one has become uh, popular. I'm not going to go into the details. It's called NCE uh, or, or info NCE. And it consists in having some, comp some competition between the, the bad guys, right? So you have one good guy and a whole bunch of bad guys. And the bad guys compete. You know, the, the, the bad guys are dangerous that are, you know, whose energy is really low are going to get pushed uh, harder. And you do, you do this with a softmax. And so that's your, that's your objective function. It's been very popular uh, in, in recent years. Uh, next slide, please. So in fact, it's led to uh, a huge progress in self-supervised learning for computer vision. So the best approaches to learning features, visual features now in a self-supervised manner is to use one of those Siamese net approaches where you show uh, a positive pair. So a, a pair X, Y that you want to give low energy to would be a pair of images where one, uh, where those two images are distorted versions of the same image in some way, right? So you, you take an image, you uh, crop it, uh, in a, you frame it in a particular way, you rotate it a bit, you scale it a bit, you change the color a little bit, you add noise, and you do this twice. And now you have two examples that basically have the same content but are slightly different. You're going to run them through two neural nets that are identical, and you're going to uh, train the system so that the two vectors are identical. Now, if you just do this, the system will collapse. It will ignore the input and produce a constant vector on the output, and you will get zero energy for everything. Uh, so, so there's this contrastive phase that is going to take samples that are dissimilar. Uh, you know they come from you know, different images and the contents are different. And for those two samples, you're going to push those two vectors h and h prime away from each other. So uh, this, as I said, the idea goes back uh, to the early 90s, but um, uh, this was used for training face recognizers at Facebook. And then there are you know, a bunch of methods, Perl, Moco, and SimClear. Perl and Moco are from Facebook, SimClear from Google, uh, which are based on this idea of contrastive learning. Um, and there's been uh, good success in uh, speech recognition also in, in uh, very recently, just last year. Next slide, please. Um, those different methods, Perl, Moco, et cetera, uh, differ by how they pick the negative samples and various other tricks. Uh, so here's an example for speech recognition before I switch to vision. Uh, this is a system called Wave2Vec that was produced by my colleagues at, uh, at Facebook. And uh, the astonishing thing with this is that if you use this sort of self-supervised pre-training, which consists in basically doing one of those joint embedding uh, where, where you, you train the representation coming out of uh, a segment of speech to be similar to the representation coming out of uh, speech signals that are next to it after some prediction. Uh, 
Um, so you, you train a system like this with you know, about a thousand hours of unlabeled speech, and then you fine tune it on 10 minutes of labeled speech. And, uh, and, and what you get is essentially the state of the art from last year of training purely supervised on 100 hours. This is uh, astonishing, but it's, it's fantastic because that uh, basically allows us, you know, Facebook, but uh, other, uh, you know, anybody now, because this is open source, uh, to, to basically have multilingual speech recognition systems that are trained with very, very little, very, very small amounts of labeled data. That allows us to handle rare languages for which we don't have a huge amount of labeled uh, speech. Next slide. Uh, yeah, I'm going to skip that. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is a multilingual speech recognition system called XLSR. Uh, okay, so in the context of, we, we're all aware that in the context of uh, uh, natural language understanding, there's been a revolution over the last two years, which consists in using self-supervised learning to train uh, very large neural nets uh, in the form of transformer architectures. And the way they train is that you take a you take Y, which would be a segment of text, you corrupt it in some way, so you you remove some of the words, you you mask them essentially, or you replace them by other words, uh, and then you train a, a large neural net to recover the uh, original one. Uh, there's another form of this where you don't train the system to recover, you just train it to produce a, a scalar energy, which is you know, good or bad. That's the, an idea that came out of Colbert and Weston's work from 2011. Um, so this basic idea is the idea of denoising autoencoder, which was uh, popularized by Pascal Vincent in, two, in 2008. Uh, I actually had things of that type for associative memory in my PhD thesis in 1997, but um, you know, uh, it's ancient, ancient uh, history. Uh, and the, you know, more recently, there is the, the, the work on, on BERT from, uh, from Google uh, together with Transformer Architectures and Roberta, from, um, which is sort of a, a play on, on, on BERT from uh, my colleagues at Facebook. Uh, and this has, this has really revolutionized NLP, right? Everybody uses this now to, to train, to pre-train NLP system. Uh, so it's really great, but you, know, you, will, you will remark that this system does not require uh, latent variables. It makes a prediction about missing information, but it doesn't have latent variable or no explicit latent variable. It actually has implicit latent variables, um, but it still works. And the reason it works in this context is that we can represent the uncertainty in the prediction through a probability distribution over discrete uh, outcomes, which are the words that are missing. Okay, so we parameterize the, the set of plausible predictions by uh, a probability distribution over each word that are missing uh, in the input and those are independent distribution, which is a bad approximation, but it's, uh, it's good enough for training. Um, but it's basically an instance of denoising autoencoder, right? Take a, take a piece of data, corrupt it, train a system to basically recover the original data from the corrupted version. And so after the system is trained, if you feed it a clean data, it will reproduce it directly. If you feed, if you feed it a noisy data, it will, uh, it will reconstruct it as the clean data. And so the reconstruction error will be large. And so that's imp uh, implicitly, it actually raises the energy of, uh, which is a reconstruction error, of points that are outside the data manifold, right? Uh, so the, the, you can interpret this in terms of, of energy-based models, uh, where you push down on the energy of data points, and then you move a little bit outside of a data point by, co by the corruption process. And you say, the energy of that point should be the reconstruction error between the original point and its noisy version. And so you get an energy profile that kind of goes up, which is symbolized at the bottom, at the bottom right here. Um, next slide, please. So the reason this works is, is because we can represent uncertainty uh, over, dis over discrete uh, uh, objects like, like words. But what if we want to apply this to images? So to images, we would, this would consist in taking an image and blanking out some, some spots in this image and then training a, uh, an autoencoder to recover the missing spots, right? And that's where we run into problems. So Deepak Patak and, and others have, have tried to do things like this, also for video. And the problem with this is that we do not have a softmax over all possible image batches or over all possible video frames. We cannot enumerate all possible video frames and represent the distribution over them. So we have to parameterize this distribution. And the problem, with the, the problem is that every interesting parameterization of distributions over images or image patches uh, basically are done through an energy function that you then need to normalize if you insist on, on being probabilistic. Uh, 
and the normalization is almost always uh, intractable. So my proposal with energy-based models is forget about the normalization altogether. Just use the energy as the, as the elementary object that you're going to manipulate. And just remember that uh, you know, you're going to have to push down and push up if you use contrasting methods, but perhaps there are other methods as well. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, uh, next slide, please. This was uh, just a way of showing that GANs are actually contrastive methods with a smart way of picking the contrastive examples. Okay, so what has revolutionized, uh, what has a lot of people excited over the last year now is that there are methods of the joint embedding type uh, without prediction to learn uh, visual features for images that are non-contrastive. So basically, the, the data points you use them to train on are distorted versions of the same image, right? And you train the system to give you a low energy for that. And then through some magic, not all of which is understood for all the methods, uh, the system will somehow give higher energy to everything else, um, to images that are, you know, it's not been explicitly trained on, basically. Uh, and, uh, and it's been sort of a little bit empirical how people have come up with those ideas, using inspiration from like other fields, uh, like reinforcement learning and stuff like that. There's one idea that uh, seems to have worked a lot, uh, uh, quite well for this technique called bootstrap your own latent, latent Simsiam, and uh, another one called uh, Moco, uh, that came out of uh, Facebook as well, where um, the, you make the two networks identical in architecture, but you use diff slightly different weights for the two of them, and, and you, you cap one of the two networks with, uh, with uh, what's called a predictor on top of it. Um, and, uh, you know, through mysterious processes that are not fully understood, uh, a system trained this way only on positive samples, if you normalize everything properly uh, and you're very careful about what you're doing, it will not collapse. It will actually produce low energy for stuff you train it on and implicitly higher energy for stuff you don't train it on. And the way the weights are, are made slightly different is that the weight of one of the networks is basically a running average of the weights of the, the other network as you train the system. It, it seems that one of the essential components in this is uh, what is, is the um, uh, normalization. Um, if you remove batch normalization from, from those networks, they basically collapse. Now, there's two interesting methods that came out of Facebook Air Research in Paris, um, uh, which uh, it's kind of a, a series of work uh, by uh, Mathilde Caron and a collaborator at Facebook Paris uh, that are based on clustering. So the deep cluster and SWAV. SWAV in particular uh, has been really, really successful. Next slide, please. Um, so th this kind of uh, gives you a, a very sort of schematic uh, idea. So this is coming out of the, 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 the paper on Simsiam uh, by uh, Chen and, and, and Ha uh, from Facebook. But there's like you know, those various ways of training those systems so that uh, either you use contrastive training like SimClear or you don't use contrastive uh, training like BYOL, SWAV, and Simsiam. Uh, and it still works, although Simsiam uh, to some extent is, is, uh, is contrastive. Uh, without going into details, let me talk about SWAV a little more. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, oh, before I, I talk about SWAV, um, I, I talk about a very, very new paper that was just posted on Archive that I'm a, I'm a, I'm a co-author of, uh, called Barlow Twins. Uh, uh, it's named after Horace Barlow, who uh, was a neuroscientist and a big advocate of efficient coding and redundancy reduction. And the idea there is you train a Siamese net um, but and you compute the uh, the cross correlation matrix between the vectors coming out of the two halves, and the training criterion is that you you force this uh, uh, cross correlation matrix to be as close as possible to the identity. So basically, you say uh, the same variable in the two net in the two halves of the network should be as correlated as possible, basically identical. Okay, uh, and then two variables. Of, of different indices should be as decorrelated as, as, as possible so that you maximize the information content of the, of the entire thing. And that actually prevents collapse. Uh, so you don't have a true contrastive phase whose dimension is a number of samples. You have a contrastive phase whose dimension is a number of variables uh, squared. And this, this uh, dimension can be very large. So this uh, algorithm uh, works really well. Uh, it's very competitive with all the other self-supervised learning methods in all the things that we tested on. So um, um, at least with sort of reasonably, reasonably sized network like ResNet 50 and things like this. And it, it, it does very good at, at transfer learning. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with, uh, with numbers here. Uh, but it allows you to use very high dimensional embedding uh, vectors uh, up to 16,000 or so. 
uh, with relatively modest uh, batch size, which is not the case for SimClear, for example, an explicit uh, um, uh, contrastive method where uh, if you go to high dimension, it becomes so prohibitively expensive as to become impractical. Next uh, slide, please. Um, so this is an application of SWAG, which uh, again was published a few days ago uh, by my colleagues at Facebook. Uh, mostly people from Facebook Paris and Facebook uh, New York, uh, Facebook Air Research in New York. Um, so there, uh, what they did was pre-train uh, using SWAG, pre-train a fairly large network called the RegNet architecture uh, with 1 billion uh, images randomly sampled from uh, Instagram. Uh, and after this pre-trained phase, you fine tune the, the network on ImageNet or a portion of ImageNet or other data sets like iNaturalist Spaces and, and Pascal VOC. And uh, this system actually uh, gets, this is probably the first, um, one of the first, if not the first system that gives better performance after pre-training than if you train uh, purely supervised from scratch, right? So the, that's the curve you see on the top right. Um, as you change the architecture, if you, tr if you train the system on ImageNet from scratch, you can saturate at about 81% correct. Uh, but if you pre-train using this method, which uses other data, of course, you can get up to 84%. Now the record on ImageNet is higher than this, but it uses other, other tricks. Okay, it's 90% or so, but um, in the same condition. Uh, this is not open source. It was open source a few days ago. So yeah. you can go to this so, other Sorry to, to interrupt you, Jan. I'm out of time, I know. Yes. Pascal Massar is speaking. We are running out of time. Yes. It would be good now to conclude in order that you can raise one or two questions, questions exactly. from the audience. So that was basically my uh, my last slide or my last interesting slide. So uh, uh, this is, so my conclusion is uh, self-supervised learning is really the future. Um, and the, the, you know, the, the key to making true progress uh, in AI, if we can figure out how to make it uh, work for things like video prediction, perhaps we'll be able to train machines to understand how the world works by observation, by training themselves to predict um, the way you know, humans and animals do. Perhaps this is a, a possible direction towards uh, machine common sense. Uh, but in any case today, it's very useful. So now we have self-supervised learning systems that revolutionize natural language processing, uh, uh, certainly are bringing astonishing progress in speech recognition. And now we're starting to see progress in computer vision and so uh, this is really kind of a, a bright spot. And I'm sort of advocating with this for this uh, formalism of energy-based models and uh, advocating to abandon the probabilistic modeling uh, because of its intractabilities, essentially. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jan. So I have uh, two questions uh, that I have selected from the numerous questions that has been raised during your talk. So those questions uh, from the audience are, first of all, does self-supervised learning could yield good results for fields where there is way less data available as in images and text data for which we have huge data sets? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's the hope. The hope is that, you know, we're going to have a, a good recipe that would, would be applicable to any type of uh, uh, of modality, uh, not just images, audio, or or text, but but just about anything, and 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 that you know if we have sufficient amounts of unlabeled data, the system will be able to basically capture the structure of the data using self-supervised learning, and then we can fine tune it with a little bit of data. So a good example of this is some work by some of my colleagues at NYU, um, Christoph Geras and his collaborators at the NYU Medical School, where they've used self-supervised learning to pre-train pre a um, uh, 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 image uh, 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 detect, uh, recognition system for medical images. You never have enough data in medical images, right? Uh, or at least enough uh, labeled data. So they've, they've used that, they've used this technique and they, they got better results than purely supervised. Thank you very much for this answer. A second question, and after that, we shall uh, turn to the uh, uh, next uh, speaker. Uh, what are the pro cons of energy-based models as compared to other baseline methods dedicated to uncertainty modeling, such as Monte Carlo, dropout, or ensembling methods? Okay, uh, so so ensembling methods. So uh, those are th three different things, right? Monte Carlo is a way to approximate 
uh, either a negative log likelihood or the gradient of a negative log likelihood by replacing an integral by a bunch of samples, okay? And so uh, this is a way to deal with the intractability of negative log likelihood. What I was arguing is that you should abandon negative log likelihood altogether uh, and use other types of cost or loss functions that don't, uh, uh, you know, don't force you necessarily to choose the samples in a particular way or to have a particular way of pushing down and pushing up on, uh, on energies of uh, good, good samples and bad samples. What I was arguing for is actually a method that does not push up, that you know, basically limits the volume of stuff that can take low energy through regularization. Uh, and there, you, know, you don't need negative log likelihood, you just need to push down on, on the energy of good samples, right? So that's for uh, Monte Carlo. Uh, dropout is a regularization method. Um, and it's a kind of virtual ensembling method, but it's, it's really a regularization method during training. So it's not really related, I think. Uh, I mean, you can use dropouts in the context of energy-based models. There's no, nothing against that. Um, and then ensembling, ensembling is a way of estimating uncertainty by you know, averaging multiple models uh, with different weight parameters or different things like this. You know, and in Bayesian neural nets are kind of a good way of doing this. This is a very good way of uh, you know, estimating uncertainty as well uh, in the probabilistic concept, in the probabilistic framework, but you can use it also in the context of energy-based model. So when I talk about the marginalization over the latent variable, you can also marginalize over parameters. And what you get is an energy-based model that where the, where the loss function is kind of a free energy uh, is marginalized over both latent variables and, and parameters. So this would be sort of a Bayesian energy-based model if you want, right? So in a way, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, Bayesian methods uh, as long as you don't use probabilities. Right? So, it's kind of a weird, weird thing to say, um, but yeah, marginalization could be could be helpful as a way of uh, regularizing your system and or uh, estimating uncertainty due to you know various uh, uh, you know indeterminacy of the parameters or or or, or latent variables or otherwise. Okay, so once again, thank you very much, Jan, and uh, now I turn to the next speaker.